Uh, welcome everyone once again to this series from Magi to Mission, the Gospel of Matthew. And today we're going to welcome Claire Jacquees, that Liz, whom Liz will introduce in a second. But before we do so, let me say the prayer for St. Matthew's Day. Almighty God, whose blessed son called Matthew the tax collector to be an apostle and evangelist, give us grace to forsake the selfish pursuit of gain and the possessive love of riches, that we may follow in the way of your son, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Over to you, Liz. Okay, so it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you, Claire, and uh, glad that you could do a talk for us on, on Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Claire is the vicar of Hale Barnes, which is basically near Manchester Airport, I think, isn't it? Yeah, that's if right. you if you listen to Radio Four uh, daily service, you may very well have heard Claire speak or lead a service before. And or if you listen to Pause for Thought on Radio Two, you might have heard Claire speak before. Um, so it's great to have you with us, Claire. We look forward to what you've got to say. Thank you. I was um, curious, I think, to. Um, wondering why you'd invited me, whether it's because, you know, I'd man <laughs> hadn't managed to avoid your gaze at some point, but um, it's, I'm delighted to be here and thank, thank you for asking me. Um, the issue with um, broadcasting is that you tend to have to do things in very, very short chunks. So you may find that the way I present today is a little bit chunky, a little bit split up, but I mean, I think I fits quite well with the way um, Matthew's Gospel is put together, but my overall thinking is that there is certainly a theme joining everything together and um, a sense of the whole story being expressed in these, these two chapters, chapter 24 and 25. Um, I think whenever we come to scripture, of course, we, we look at things in, in different ways. Um, it may be because we're going through a particular period in our lives or experience or aware of certain things in, in the news or we have a particular approach. So um, I'm going to share my screen and just illustrate what I'm saying really with, with some pictures. Uh, now that's not showing my screen, is it? <coughs> Let me screen share thing me. There you go. So this is one of my favourite images of um, St Matthew from the Lindisfarne Gospels. And I was sort of slightly curious as to who the man is peeping out behind the, the curtain. Um, have you talked about this before, Jane and Liz? No. Um, so here's Matthew writing his Gospel. And um, the person peeping out is actually one of the, is the symbol for Matthew, which is um, the man, Luke the ox. Um, St Mark the lion and um, John the eagle. So it's not anybody in particular, but it's just the sign of, um, that is associated with Matthew. So here are some lenses, different lenses that we might use as we read a text of any kind, not necessarily the Bible, um, but I think the Bible gives us challenges us really about whether we look at a text with our own perspective or whether the text is going to to challenge us I'd hope that when I read the Bible I'm not simply getting an echo chamber of what I want it to believe and that I get a challenge um, in different ways of looking at it and find through that different ways the Holy Spirit might speak um, to me through that text and I think in the chapters that we're looking at today, chapters 24 and 25, Matthew may well be doing that with his own particular lens. Um, I know that David Law is coming to speak to you in a couple of weeks time. Um, we had a very interesting talk from him about the different lenses um, that we use to look at scripture. And um, when I told him what my approach was, he said, oh, well, yours is definitely archaeological. So I don't know whether that's a sign that um, I'm a bit of 
afraid to, to branch out with some of these different views, say, um, looking at the scriptures through feminist eyes or queer eyes or the eyes of uh, liberation theology, political, looking at it with um, a lens of race. But I think I probably identify with the, the guy at the bottom um, in the manuscript with his um, rather strange glasses reading scripture. Lots of different ways you might think of that we can analyze and understand scripture. And no one may be right or wrong. We choose uh, or are guided in our own times and contexts. And I think that allows us space for the creative action of the Holy Spirit. Um, our views may change, we may think, see things differently at different times. The circumstances and knowledge changes, our lens may change. So reflect perhaps as we go through about what your particular lens or perspective is at the moment. Is it detailed analysis? Is it looking at it through political or emotional lenses? Working in broadcasting, um, one of, although I've not worked in the journalistic side, I, I tend to work in the um, worship and more reflective music side of um, religious broadcasting. There always needs to be a particular angle or something to catch the story. So it's not just simply a statement of fact, which isn't very interesting, but um, journalists try to find something that is going to make a story. And so that's why often um, we get bad news as the thing that attracts people's attention and why people always blame the press. But uh, we still buy the papers and we may look at the um, headlines and that might enable us to, to choose something from the, the supermarket um, shelves as to which paper we're going to read. I do remember that um, Sunday sport. I don't know if that's still um, still still going, but that used to be basically a whole load of totally made up stories. Um, there was also that wonderful one um, in the Daily Star, Freddie Star at my hamster, which I never knew whether it was true or not, but it certainly sold papers and, and um, made the news. Of course, the ideal headline we always used to say was Vicar found drugged and naked on a bed of flames. It has religion, it has um, social comment, it has sex, and it has uh, tragedy and disaster. Vicar found drugged and naked on a bed of flames. Not something you probably see in the Justice Diocese and the Eve Bulletin, but you never know. So I think that kind of headline feels like something that will introduce these chapters in Matthew's Gospel, talking about the end times there is a sense of disaster, of everything coming to an end. That could be positive, could be negative. And I think Matthew teases us in a way to help us to think through um, what perspective we're going to take on that. Tradition, uh, Jewish tradition had it that, that the end was going to be something very positive. At the time when everyone in Israel would be sitting under their own fig tree, Micah put it like this in chapter four. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. Maybe good times are just around the corner. But the prophets also had a different kind of perspective. They talked about the end, the day of the Lord, as something very dark indeed. Zephaniah wrote, the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. And I think in these chapters of Matthew, we get that sense of disaster building upon disaster as the sign of the end. These chapters are Matthew's apocalypse, what the end will be like. But as we read it, and as those who um, would have read that gospel um, read it, there is an irony, isn't there, that the end is approaching. 
and we know that the next chapters will be about betrayal and trial, crucifixion and also resurrection. But this also gives a context of where people are now. People would have been reading that gospel in a time of uncertainty and anxiety, a failed optimism. The day of the Lord wasn't what we thought and neither was the Messiah, it seems. Already Matthew's lens, we've talked about um, in earlier meetings about Matthew writing for Christians with a Jewish background. And so all this imagery, I think, relates to that Jewish history and ultimately to the whole story of salvation. We think about exile, loss, return and hope, that pattern of salvation history. And this is a point, a point of exile and loss. And Matthew goes on to talk about how faith might live through those negative situations, both historical and emotional and even spiritual. The kind of destruction that Zephaniah talked about, for example, is because of human recalcitrance and failure to comply with the laws of the covenant. And people would know the history. It led to the destruction of the Northern Kingdom, exile to Assyria, and then the rest of uh, the people, the Southern Kingdom, taken into Babylon, where that sense of the destruction of everything led to people writing down our scriptures, lest those memories be lost. So here is Matthew writing, perhaps with the same thought in mind. But that time of exile and writing down and reflection also led to a new way of understanding of how God is with us, not anchored to a geographical or architectural location, however helpful those symbols might have been, a chance to rethink. And so I think the themes here link the vocabulary of the rethinking of spirituality, of thinking about who Jesus is, to overturn assumptions or to reinterpret or to fulfil prophetic messages. Here is the temple destroyed. The temple is the place where God chose to make his presence known. The treasure of the people's faith was there. They looked towards it. This was where worship was valid and done properly. This was the aim, the longing, the place of hope in time of loss, both in the history for Matthew and in the present. So exile and living in a strange land was part of Jewish history and was now brought up to present, the present day. People would have known about the destruction of the temple in the year 70. Contemporaries would have known or, or would have known that through their family histories. The temple, in a way, is one way perhaps of destroying things that we might make into idols, material things, regardless of what their original purpose was. And I guess it's not difficult to find in our own times examples of idolatry that puts greed or physical appearance or academic achievement or riches as a place um, of worship. This destruction is a chance to make us think about what it is and what it really means to be human. There is also a point of important symbolism about Jesus giving this message on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, this is a view, modern view of the Mount of Olives, um, where you were able to look at the whole city of Jerusalem. You would look on either its destruction or as a place where the resurrection traditionally would happen. And so that's why people are buried there. Great Jewish scholars and rabbis, business people, other notable people. This was going to be the place where the Messiah would return. And here he is, sitting on the Mount of Olives. 
that significance, I think, would not have been lost on Matthew's hearers. It seems a very suitable place to talk about the end times, to look on destruction and reconstruction. Curiously, Matthew is the only one of the gospel writers who use the Greek, uses the Greek word parousia, meaning the end of the age. Parousia used in Greek to describe the victorious entry of a Hellenistic king into a conquered city. Maybe this is dramatic irony again. We're being pointed to look forward to the message of Palm Sunday and beyond. Even the Mount of Olives would traditionally split in two, the rabbis would say, at the end of time. Look on further to the gospel account, Matthew's gospel account of the resurrection and tombs are split open. The whole story is embodied um, and illustrated by hints through these chapters. One of the other signs of the end, of course, is false messiahs. We know probably quite a lot about those. One of my favourite um, views of false messiahs were the ones in the film The Life of Brian, where Brian was acknowledged as the messiah, um, at the point where his mother said he wasn't the messiah, he was a very naughty boy. But here are a list of, or here is a, a, an array of different people who might have been regarded as messiahs. Rebellion throws up zealots and rebels, and also claims to be Moses returning before the end. All these signs, Matthew says, needs a healthy scepticism. So Matthew tells present history using terms of the past, which is a common um, way of doing things um, in those writing about the end times. Think of um, Daniel's description of um, the coming of the Son of Man and the end of time. This was a, a story written to help people through their present difficulties without actually naming them. So Daniel talks about the desolating sacrilege that uh, we read about in, the, in, in Matthew's Apocalypse. This sacrilege in, um, in Daniel was about placing an idol in the temple. This was the Olympian Zeus, the statue that was placed there that desecrated the place where no idol should have been seen. It was put there by the Hellenistic despot Antiochus IV Epiphanes. That's a, a picture of his head there on the right, put there in uh, 168 to 7 BCE. Statues were also traditionally placed at the west end of temples, and that's one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why Christians face east, away from the idolatry. People in Matthew's time would also have remembered the famine in year 46, earthquakes in year 61, all those things would have been in their memory. And their reaction may have been in all kinds of different ways. Maybe they would have felt quite numbed. Maybe they would have felt they needed to act. Matthew goes on to point out a bit later, which is the reaction that is the way for Christians. There is also persecution, something that um, certainly was the case in the time of Antiochus. Loss of trust in family relationships, in political power, this was certainly an exile experience, so formative in understanding where God is or is not. In exile, we are cut off from all those things, buildings, cult, and experienced God with us, God not tied to a place. And so that's a real challenge here to think about what is meant by God with us. And I think it also points to the fact that the Christian faith is not just another cult because it changes and adapts. And I think through scripture and the challenge of scripture through the Holy Spirit, it means that faith grows and that we are constantly refreshed in our thinking and our understanding about God. We gain 
a perspective with experience and reflection. I think looking at this scripture with a 21st century lens, we can't but read into these stories, the signs of our own times. It wasn't difficult to find um, pictures in the news of these kinds of destruction of what is certain and that we build our hope on. Buildings and homes, defeat of heroes, a loss of confidence in leaders, wars, famines, earthquakes. A, contem a contemporary browser of the internet gives us all these kinds of in illustrations. And maybe Ukraine has brought it closer to our reality. Here is the earthquake in Iran. Signs of war that we've been all too familiar with. Destruction of buildings and lives in Ukraine. We read about Matthew's warning. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing infants in those days. I mean, maybe not something that we think of as quite so close to home. Although with our food banks and the economic challenges to people on the poverty line, it draws all that much more closer. And of course, the false messiahs. So maybe we are experiencing the birth pangs. Maybe that's how we read it today. But Matthew goes on to talk about a positive outcome being possible. We can come through danger and endure what is bad. These birth pangs are powerful and unavoidable. And that human sense of loss can be overwhelming then in history for Matthew's contemporaries and for us now. And that feels quite gloomy. But these are very realistic comments. And these events give a realistic perspective. And maybe in a lighter mood, it means that we don't need to take every negative experience as the end. There are a couple of people who sit behind me at the United match, who every time the opposite team gets the ball in the 10 yard box, console themselves with sarcastic comments. This is it, this is the goal. Quite often it is, but not always. So Matthew is saying these terrible things don't necessarily mean total destruction. The end is something different. And so Matthew's lens for all connects with salvation history. And he promises that a sign will appear in heaven. This is an icon of the coming of the Son of Man. I don't know how many of you um, are familiar with the, um, the way in which icons are painted, but the gold at the back of an icon which always is the, the beginning of the icon, even though other colours and um, uh, designs may go on top of it. The gold is the sign of God's creative and loving power behind everything. And so here, there is quite a lot of gold showing. In many icons, you don't see very much. Maybe it just appears in, in halos or in, in highlights. But here, there is a lot of gold. Here is the coming of the Son of Man. Here is God coming in salvation. And I think it, by mentioning this particular um, event, I think it helps to give a sign of, of hope. It's as if that in order for Messiah to come, everything humans value in terms of earthly certainty and comfort needs to be stripped away, or at least we need to be made aware of our um, 
that we do not need to um, depend on that, whether it's clothing or family life or weather. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. The Sabbath, I think, is quite a slightly strange reference, but maybe that um, fits with Matthew's Jewish audience. If you had to run away, take your possessions, carry a burden, pray that it's not on the Sabbath because you have that conflict of leaving a place of destruction and breaking the law that forbade you to carry a burden. You may even have to disobey the laws that made you feel safe up to now. Then we get this curious proverb about the vultures. Wherever the corpse is, the vultures will gather. Reading commentaries, you'll see that um, it was a, a common proverb that was um, used to show that the meaning would be obvious to everyone. Of course, anywhere where there is a body, where there is a corpse, the vultures will gather. It's something inevitable, something that everyone will see. The meaning is obvious. And I think that's interesting um, in relation to the gospel, because it moves beyond the things that tie us um, to our faith into a much more um, universal view of what it is, of what God's kingdom is about. Of course, everyone will experience those losses outlined for the end. The one will follow the other. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will follow. Maybe that vivid image also brings us close to the horrors of death and loss in very physical terms, perhaps even preparing hearers' hearts and thoughts for the horrors of crucifixion that they'll be reading about later. I think it's a strangely key text giving a lens for much that is to come. This public message is not only for the disciples or the church, but for all people and about all people's behavior. This is a new creation from the darkness of nothing. Crucifixion precedes resurrection. It may be as we think, as we hope, or it may be something much stranger, not as we thought of at all. This is a, an abstract view of the coming of the Son of Man. And I think the description of Jesus as Son of Man is, is also an ambiguous one. Jesus seems to use it of himself to describe his um, humanity. But also there is a sense in which there is a connection between the earthly and the heavenly. The description of incarnation, Jesus as Messiah, is also human. Here is the second coming of Messiah. Were people expecting it in their lifetime? Very likely. But I think Matthew's account also prepares believers for delay because he does give teaching about what to do meanwhile and how to behave. I don't know whether any of you have picked up um, Melvin Bragg's In Our Time about charisma on Radio 4. It's worth uh, going back and listening to that again. I only heard a snippet of it, but it was about how cults, um, charismatic leaders who talked about the end of the world built a cult of people around them and were very specific about the end. And when it didn't happen in 1843, they had to change the date to 1844. And when it didn't happen after that, well, they, the whole cult dissolved. And so there is a sense, I think, in which that Christianity cannot become a cult because there will always be a change. We see the signs, but the coming of the Son of Man, the coming of Messiah isn't something that we can pinpoint um, for ourselves. So this makes Christianity very different. And so we go on to hear teaching about how we are to live in these last days. The darkness is fearful, but it's also signifying a new kind of creation. 
and the references to Noah that we hear will have that meaning. The end of all that is wrong, a sign of new life. The Noah story itself is based on an ancient story of creation. So the icon gives us something of the flavour outside our experience, the gold of heavenly existence. The contemporary picture gives us something unusual, strange, challenging. But it says something about what's happening now. It's not just about giving in because the Son of Man will appear in heaven with trumpets, uh, with a great public experience like those vultures and the corpse. The signs are inevitable, but there is also hope pointing beyond and return from exile. So the next series of um, descriptions move us on to what happens meanwhile, what to do, how to be if we're living in uncertainty about dates and times. So we get a series of parables and metaphors that give us guidance. A series of much more domestic scenes, series things that we can connect with that contrast with those apocalyptic horrors that have gone before. It brings things closer to home and so helps us to think about how we should respond. There is the story of the fig tree with its leaves, how we see the signs of summer coming and trust God. The fig tree again, that symbol of the day of the Lord in a very positive sense when we shall all sit under our own fig tree. The story of the bridesmaids about having to be alert and having your oil ready or your AAA batteries, depending on what your lamp is in these days. You will be taken by surprise by the date. The wedding image often used in scripture for God's relationship with God's people. Oil as a symbol of repentance and healing. Of course, there is that biblical precedent of Noah. Compared with the everyday life today, people in a field, people grinding meals, um, people grinding corn, a burglary in someone's home, all stress the suddenness of the end, but also the promise of a new story, a new start. So the Noah story gives us that alternative creation story. We think again of the spirit of God moving over the face of the formless and chaotic world, nothing for us to hang on to. We then hear about household practice, slaves who reckon they can get away with the abuse of their master's property and staff, and the talents, not just about keeping safe what you have now, but keeping on living as God wants, flourishing, not simply holding on to something and it never changing or developing or growing. The Holy Spirit continuing to create new things growing out of the old. Again, that suddenness gives us no time to get things right in the moment. So the way we need to live, Matthew suggests, is a state of mind and condition of behaviour. It could have originally, this story about the talents have been a story told in criticism of the scribes who buried the law under a mass of regulation. And then we come on to judgment. Many images have fired the imagination but so often they're there as a threat, an encouragement to just get on with life. I love the story of um, Ian Paisley preaching about um, the end of the world and the uh, gnashing of teeth. And someone spoke up in the congregation and said, I have no teeth. And Ian Paisley, Paisley saying that in the last days, teeth will be provided. But we hear then about the judgment, the division of sheep and goats. Goats apparently needed more care than the sheep. The sheep could get on with things, so one needed to divide them. So we here have just a sense of division, not necessarily a labelling of goats as evil, although people have gone on sometimes to interpret it in that way. We have that picture of hell to one side and those who are saved on the other. And we hear about the importance of watching and about the importance of deeds of mercy, which of course are recognised in Jesus' behaviour. That public idea again of the way we live needs to be public. It's not simply held by the Christian faith or by the church 
people who perform acts of mercy and kindness are all part of God's kingdom. It's not about counting up bits of forgiveness or doing good because it gets us closer to heaven. This is a public kind of mercy, something very visual, the vultures around the corpse. Then maybe people signed up to faith, maybe not. Two in a field, two grinding corn. There's no way I think the church can think it's got Jesus to itself. Anthony the Great wrote, feeding the hungry, welcoming strangers and visiting the sick are mundane acts. In this sense, virtue is not far from us, nor is it without ourselves. It is within us and is easy if only we are willing. So we can see a pattern of salvation history in these chapters. How creation comes from darkness and leads to a new creation. How ordinary living is important. How we need to be ready, but not obsessive about seeing significance in everything. And also perhaps that God is with us through those hard times and that we simply need to get on with those acts of mercy. So it changes the way human beings are called to live and treat each other. There is a promise of ultimate justice. And it emphasizes, I think, our ignorance and our need to trust in God. So now the story will move on into the next chapters, into the darkness that maybe we feared and beyond. So these chapters prepare us for what's to come. Crucial, literally part of the story of salvation, where victory emerges from what seems hopeless. Betrayal, hypocrisy, envy, the abuse of power, fear, death, all of these things will be on trial now. Mm. Thank you very much for that, Claire. There's a lot to think about there. It feels like the time that we're living in, it's uh, very appropriate to be reading these passages. I know. I mean, that description yeah. about the pregnant woman, you know, as you think, yeah. gosh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got time for probably one or two questions, so but you need to be jumping quick with it. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Eric. You're not yeah. Eric. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, somehow the name switched. I'll, I'll get him to sort that. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. That was fabulous. Matthew 24, 25. It, it is so relevant of today. I've been studying um, uh, Revelation, Revelation Forum, a glimpse of God's throne room. It's so exciting. The bow, the emerald. It's really wonderful. But I did want to ask this question from Thessalonians. Thessalonians 4. Uh, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And the rest of it, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord. I wondered what you thought of that and, and where that would fit in. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I suspect it was one of those images that people found helpful to describe what it would mean at the end of time and the end of everyone's mm -hmm. life, that sense of sort of being being gathered. I mean, it's the it's that wonderful image, isn't it, of the um, yeah. Jesus longing to gather people under under his his wing. And obviously, yes. you know, clouds and heavens were um, a way of describing the uh, the other, weren't they? Um, mm. I mean, I think one of the fascinating things you talk about Revelation. Um, I had a friend who was an artist who um, spent time trying to depict visually what was being described in Revelation. And she found it almost impossible because of the way it was. And I think it would be interesting to think about how you might paint the pic that picture in Thessalonians. Mm. What would it look like? And actually when you mm. try and kind of put it together, it's a mosaic, isn't it? Rather yeah. than necessarily um, a description. But I mean, that's, that's, that's my interpretation anyway. Yeah, thank you for that. Because yeah. the church will be taken out according to that scripture. 
Well, maybe, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and what you know, Matthew's saying is that um, the people of God isn't necessarily the people we think of. Well, for yes. want of a better description, contained in a building. I mean, I know that's that's not the case, but you know, it's the people yeah. who acts of mercy that are the people who form yeah. part of the of God's kingdom. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I don't think there are any more questions. Shall I hand back to Jane to remind us what we're doing next week? Yes, sure. So next week we've got Josie Tuplin talking about um, the passion narrative, almost the um, the crescendo that we're coming to in Matthew's gospel. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you so much indeed for that taking us through those particular passages. A lot to take today, I think, with Ukraine and other places. So God bless. See you next week. I shall say, would it be an idea to send a reminder out? We've got a lot.